Okay. Love your what shirt. Is- so colorful. It's actually a dress. Oh, is it? Yeah. Rent the runway. I was going to say a lot of people, uh, the big thing in the news is everyone's doing tie dye right now. So I thought maybe you were tie dyeing something. Yeah. <laughs> when that, that's a little creative for me. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining me today. And uh, how are you doing in quarantine? I'm doing great, actually. I'm kind of loving it. And you're next, you door, it. you're next door in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. And my kids are in, at home, homeschooling. So luckily, my husband does most of that. <laughs> And you still love your kids after all this time? I think I love them a little more. <laughs> I think I see your husband going up the stairs behind you. you just disagree. That's my boyfriend. Oh, that's your boyfriend? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, well, uh, you just have an incredible story. And uh, when I was doing some research on you, because we're here really to talk about cherry picks, but when I started doing research and I find out really who you were, you have produced some of my favorite films over the last few years. Uh, the Squid oh, yeah. Mouse, Swiss Army Man. I'm just like, oh my God, of course I want to talk to her. Oh, great. So sorry, I have this. Okay. Oh, it's okay. It's in the, <laughs> in the world of Zoom, we get the clicks and the, the messages and everything. But tell me about your story. So you grew up in Vail, Colorado. Like, how did you get to Hollywood? <laughs> By, no, um, actually, Brian Dennehy, um, you know, who passed away recently, was a friend of my father's and he... Uh, was my mentor. And um, I saw him do a movie once when I was little and on set and fell in love with it and just said, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. And then from when I was eight years old on, I was doing whatever I could to be in the movie business and uh, got a degree in, in New York and then came out here and struggled and then set up my own production company. And I don't know how I ended up as, as a, doing a website called Cherry Picks. I mean, how that was never part of my plan, but it uh, happened. And Brian Denning, you know, I'm Generation X, and he just, I grew up watching him, you know, everything from Cocoon to Silverado is one of my all time favorites. And, oh God, and you know, he was brilliant on, and he was brilliant on the stage too. He was a great stage actor. Yeah, he won a Tony in 1999, and I got to be there with him at, at that Tony's. So it's, it's, it's bittersweet, but, um, you know, he had a great life and he inspired so many people and, 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 and was able to <laughs> inspire me. And I'm glad I saved his texts. <laughs> and you're from Vail and all of my family's from Grand Junction. So no, uh, no way. Yeah. Oh my God. We're neighbors. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, the, I'm neighbor. the only one born in Las Vegas. I'm the only one born in Las Vegas, but all of my family are, they came from Grand Junction for many, many years. And I spent many summers as a child in Grand Junction where everything was named after the county. Mesa this and oh, Mesa yeah. that. Yeah. I got my ears pierced in Grand Junction at the only mall that we had to drive to. That's hysterical. We used to go through Fruta, which was bigger than Grand Junction, yeah. I think, back then. Yeah, so it's yeah. crazy. Well, welcome to Colorado, fellow Colorado. Thank you. I love your shirt, too. Are you bowling? Huh? No, it's my thing as the <laughs> Vegas film critic. I do all these different kind of shirts I have, you know, so yeah, it's kind of Oh, retro-y. I love that shirt. Well, thank you. And so... How did you find your best talents when you got to Hollywood? Because there could be so many things. You obviously ended up as a producer and many other things. But how did you find out which talent was best suited for you in Hollywood? Uh, I haven't found that yet. <laughs> no. Um, you know, honestly, it's just, it's not like finding a talent or whatever. Um, because so much of it is really just about passion and joy, right? Right. So I really have no idea if I'm talented at anything that I, that I do, but I know that I have a lot of passion and joy acting and producing and directing and now making cherry picks um, and writing actually, doing a lot of writing. And as long as I'm still, you know, experiencing fulfillment in, and, and creative like happiness uh, and still being able to make a living, <laughs> then it doesn't matter if I'm talented or not. <laughs> And of course, once you got to Hollywood, did anyone help you or mentor you along the way? Were there certain people that just gave you a leg up or some advice? Brian, Brian Dennehy did. You know, he got me some auditions um, and he was always that kind of there to tell me to, to, to not do it and that it was awful just to be an actor. And, and I needed control over my own career, which kind of helped me start my production company, even though that was unheard of at the time for a girl who was not famous to, to start one. Um, but I did partner with a man at the time because that's kind of what you needed to do back then. Um, and, but no, I had a hard time 
it was a much, I mean, nowadays, I think women are much more um, willing to and wanting to mentor other younger women. Whereas before, when I first got here 20 years ago, it was more of a like, don't get in my lane. Well, that's changed a lot. <laughs> it's changed a lot. Thank God. And uh, being a producer, I mean, listen, Swiss Army Man, the Squid and the Whale, being Frank. I mean, I was at Sundance. Did you? And my best friend's Tony Toscano in Salt Lake. I and so, talk to Tony. Yeah, I know. And so, wait, did we? And I interviewed uh, Gaffigan when he came by our suite that we had. So, were you there? Did I not meet you? Or probably you did, but he was there. He was at Sundance for um, the movie on Amazon, and we had done Being Frank before that. We had done Being Frank. We were at South by Southwest the year before, and it was like on tour. Yeah, because so we really it. Jim that always night. shows up anywhere at Sundance, right? So I get confused over the <laughs> years what movie he was there for. And I think we did 40 interviews in January in our suite. Yeah, it was that many people came by, and we had to turn yeah. people away. We couldn't, we couldn't handle anymore. Yeah. No, Jim, um, yeah, being frank, thank you. And I directed, that was my first narrative feature directing. So that was, I think that's my fit, my, my biggest fit right now. And when you shot Being Frank, uh, you know, a lot of famous directors talk about anytime they start a motion picture, they never sleep the night before. And some get sick, some get nervous. So how were you the night before you started directing your first film? Um, I was fine, actually. It was weird. I, um, it's very hard when you're directing a film because you start off, you know, like you have to be there first thing on Monday at 5 a.m. And then like by the time Friday, your daytime starts at like 5 p.m., right? So you're moving into night. So it's hard. So I did... I will admit I did have to take some sleeping pills to keep my, <laughs> you know, like make sure I slept, make sure I was on time. But, um, you know, I've been on set as a producer at that point for so long and I had prepared so much with the actors beforehand in rehearsals and I had had so much um, good pre-production team that I don't think I was nervous. I mean, other, <laughs> I, I was more nervous that we had Samantha Mathis who had just come in two weeks earlier to fill another person's part uh, who had to drop out. Now I went to film school, I'm a Las Vegas native, and I went to film school at UNLV here, and I was their first film class, it was the first time they offered a four year degree. And I wonder what kind of director you are, because I can't stand the technical side of filmmaking. I can't stand lenses or, or you know, all of that stuff. I just want to work with the actors and see my vision. So like if I don't care about, you know, handling the camera. In fact, I have, I get panic attacks if I have to do technical stuff. And I, I did have to, to graduate, you had to be a DP and all that. And I just, that's what I was worried about. So as a, as a director, did you kind of trust your DP to do all those kind of things? Or are you an actor's director or both? I, I, both. Um, I'm very interested in all the aspects of technology and, and filmmaking and different types of filmmaking. So I was definitely very hands-on. Obviously I didn't operate the camera or anything, because I'm not in that union <laughs> and I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but it is something I'd love to learn. Not that I'd ever want to like actually DP my own film, but I don't know. I mean, never say never. I and use the DP from um, the, the movie I produced with Richard Gere called Norman. Yes. Uh, and so it's my friend, he's Israeli, Israeli, and I have another movie with him as well coming up or getting ready, we shut down. And when I see your, your uh, filmography, it just says so much about your personality. You know, so it's from Swiss Army Man, to, I, I saw Norman, and when I just started seeing who I was speaking to today, I was like, wow, this really shows just these kind of films that are just quirky and independent, and it just says a lot about your personality and, and your vision. I love it. Thanks, I'm, thank you. I'm, Thank you for so much. <laughs> I was watching Swiss Army Man for the first time. It's like, what the hell is this movie? And then just, you know, these, that's the kind of movie you got to just got to get into. And it's just talk about original. I mean, I never forgot that. I think that made my top 10 that year too. It's definitely the most original movie I've ever made, been a part of. And it's funny because, you know, a lot of people really, really love that film. And um, some people, I've had people come up to me and they're like, you made Swiss Army Man? I hated that movie. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, cool. You know, I mean, I think it's really great if you can get good, strong feelings either way. Right, and, and talk about, you know, Daniel Radcliffe just trashing Harry Potter and just forging his own way in Hollywood, doing so many different kinds of films. I just applaud him for that. He's just, it's just a great guy to do something that's nothing what people expect. Yeah, and he's, you know, he, he is so talented. I mean, there was so much physical, um, like, acting that had to be done to play a corpse, make it believable that you're a dead guy and you're talking in this guy's imagination. I mean, it's, it's so, there was so much physical, like, 
acting in that, and he was a master. Now, being a Las Vegas native, I know all too well the amazing Jonathan. And, <laughs> I, and, and I don't know if you were there that night. I was there for the premiere of his film at the Palms Hotel. I was there. Uh, no, I was not there in Vegas, but I was there for Sundance when we premiered at Sundance. But um, no, I wasn't there uh, for that. Where was I? I know, well, you, know the screening I'm, you know the screening I'm talking about at the Palms that he had. Yes, I do. I, I'm aware of it, but I don't, I wasn't, I think I was working on another movie by then. And I think I was at Sundance when you brought that there too, but I can't remember why we didn't connect or something. You know how crazy it is when you get there. And well, I was a producer on that and people don't really talk to producers as much as they talk to directors and talent. I do. Oh, I, I talk to producers <laughs> like I'm doing now because I love the filmmaking process, you know, so I love directors. And a lot of times when the studio said that, look, I want to talk to the director or I want to talk to the producer, they're like, why? They don't seem to understand that. But I, you know, being a, a film fanatic, I just love all aspects of the filmmaking process. And, and, uh, and, and the amazing Jonathan, that was just, just an incredible documentary. And, and I had a friend who was one of his personal assistants back in, in the early 2000s when he was at Planet Hollywood. And uh, so wow. just, that, that's, a touching, uh, that's a touching documentary. Oh, thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. So let's talk about being a critic because you know, this is my 25th year as a film critic. And I, I, went, I, you know, I went to film school and I was one of those kids that came out thinking, you know, I'm going to be a director, I'm going to be a producer. And I did a movie show at UNLV TV back in the day and with another film student. And I said, look, why are we going to try to break into Hollywood with a script or a, or a student film? Let's get in through criticism because Siskel and Ebert don't speak for our generation. And so once we, we got dual baccalaureates in film and journalism communications, we started right away you know this business and how many movies come out and over 25 years, it just, you can't get off this merry-go-round. So uh, this is my 25th year as a film critic. So with your cherry picks, you know, I'm dying to talk to you about your attitude about criticism and, and all about your site. Sure, well, thank you. I mean, I think like you kind of put, you hit the nail on the head that people seem to forget. And when I say people, I mean filmmakers. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to forget that, that critics are film lovers. Um, and, you know, are really knowledgeable about film and film history and how they're made and everything. And their criticism, whether or they like your film or not, shouldn't necessarily matter to you as, as you know, as your own, as your own filmmaker. I, for me, anyway, I mean, no one likes to get a bad review. I've gotten tons of bad reviews, but I like to grow from those reviews it, as long as they're, you know, um, helpful criticism instead of just like, I hate this person, whatever, but criticism that's like, you know, the music didn't hit or this was slow or whatever. I'm like, oh, wow, that's good. I can learn from that. Um, but, you know, I started Cherry Picks because, you know, we've been uh, taught to look at a score of a film on Metacritic or Rotten Tomatoes. And based on that score, it's either don't see it or see it. And that's really hard as a filmmaker um, and a, a producer or distributor or whatever. And, um, I wanted something that was more like, well, because I think there's some movies that are worth seeing, just not worth going to see. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And there's some like you don't want to miss. And then maybe that's just because I'm a woman. So then I was kind of like, well, where's the female critical score of this one movie? Like, where can I, where can I find all the critics that are women and like average what they think on this? And it didn't exist. Like, a, there was sites that had the women, you know, women writers on it, and there were like, you know, 25 something 22 percent of the women in Rotten Tomatoes were which is not enough <laughs> it's like, yeah, definitely. 50, 50. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I just decided I would make I would make a site that would collect the female or female identifying kind of point of view of movies because we we like not not that we're all the same or you're all the same or anyone's all the same but um, I don't know I just think well, there's different tastes now Okay, now you're doing the cherry picks, you're doing the movie reviews now, but if you're serious about criticism, where, where does your, how do you take it seriously? Because if you're to be a critic like me professionally, we review maybe two, 300 movies. Well, I don't, we don't review any movies on cherry picks. Well, I mean, That's but I mean, you just talk about, you get to get them together and you talk about different topics, all right? Well, what cherry picks is, is it's actually um, a site where we curate other film critics. Right, so right, we, right. Mm -hmm. we grab all of them and we basically link to those sites so that these critics can actually get attention for their blogs or they've been hired by the New York Times, yay, uh, or you know they've gotten other jobs and they're writing for other places and really highlighting the women's voices who are writing about those movies and they are professional critics. Now, at the same time, 
we do hire um, female journalists as well to write entertainment pieces about movies that are current or coming up. So we have one on there about, you know, women who kick ass, you know, women of action, you know, that Valerie Complex, who is a cherry picker, um, what that means that she has a profile on our page and she can share it and she writes criticism for lots of other places, but we pay her to write for us more like entertainment stories that we think are important for that women want to read. And with the pandemic, I have seen so many of my colleagues being laid off or uh, it's just, they may never come back. Once if, when Hollywood starts back up again, uh, a lot of uh, blogs, a lot of radio, a lot of television, they're just, a, you know, entertainment's the first thing to go, you know, when it comes budget. Calls, so. And freelance yep. writing is. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure we did for our cherry pickers, which are the female writers out there, is allow them to have a Patreon link, or uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, in their bio so that they could not just be like, hey, give me money, but they could share their work and, and ask for like donations that way with the work that they're doing, whether it's on other sites or through our own. I have one myself. I have a Patreon account too. We, I think we all do because, you know, and it's amazing that the response has been for people who follow you and admire your work and turn to your work, you know, because that's how a film critic is. You find a critic that matches your taste. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. And uh, so I have my Patreon account up there too because revenue has dried up considerably so quickly uh, because Hollywood's closed essentially. Um, and as yeah. a producer, tell me about what you think uh, the 2020 award season is going to look like. What's your opinion? Well, you know, the whole award thing for me, I'm still, I, I still really have very little knowledge of other than it's very expensive and uh, <laughs> unfair. Um, so I don't know in terms of the awards, but I can tell you that as a producer right now, you know, I was in the middle of filming this movie with Tandy Newton called God's Country in Montana. And we had two weeks left and we had to shut down. And that was a really strange experience to go through and knowing that you were laying off crew that was not going to be able to get a job anywhere else was heartbreaking. Um, and I'm worried about the, the crew and those people, you know, who rely on the kind of day to day, you know, the PAs and the ADs and the second ADs and the ACs and all that, you know, that's, what are they doing right now? Um, and, and how hard is that? That that's more my concern. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's just one day at a time. That's what I tell people because they ask me all the time. And, and believe it or not, um, we are busier than ever. With, and this is what's great. Uh, there's a positive thing to the pandemic is that now independent films, video on demand, and some of these real smaller films are really getting their time in the spotlight. And uh, so I've been reaching out to all these different smaller movies and they're just thrilled to talk about it and getting all this attention. They, you know, cause they have to fight against the big movies from the big studios. So as someone who comes from independent film, you know, it, it's, it's alive and well right now. Yeah, I mean, what's great, like you said, what's great about this pandemic, you know, other than people <laughs> surviving it, is that, um, you know, I think we've proven now that these rules that exhibitors, and I love exhibitors, you know, I mean, that's like the only job I haven't done yet is have a movie theater. But um, like I said, never say never. But, mm. you know, to demand a 90 day window, which means like 93 months before like from, from your movie going to theater to going, you know, into VOD or on DVD, that's really expensive and hard for indie films. And, um, and, so a lot of indie films would have to take deals with distributors who can do day and date, which is what we're seeing right now, right? Because everyone's at home or whatever. And that and the theaters don't want that because then they can see it at home. And and people are watching at home. Well, so they have the to. Theaters, they have to right now. Yeah. And, and even the big boys now, even the big studios with Trolls World Tour coming out and now oh, some others, they can't, like that. they can't have their $100 million film sitting there. They've written checks for already. They've got to make some revenue back too. They can and go they bankrupt. Are. Yeah, and they are. They are. Yeah. So really this is about, you know, the exhibitors and about what, you know, and, and what the financiers in terms of like the machines of Hollywood, like what they demand in terms of box office, you know, reporting for, for demands and SVOD and VOD is still not fully accurate. And whereas you box office is very, you know, you can see it plain and simple. So a lot of things are going to have to change. One being that movie theaters are going to need to make more events and more event movies 
I just think, I think, you know, I think it was, uh, it was, you know, many, many years ago that the, the, the court said they couldn't, the theaters and the studios couldn't own the theaters. They couldn't, they had, remember they had to break that up. But I think that in, in this content driven world, I think there's enough to go around. I think there's enough for the studios to release some films, you know, to streaming sites like Disney plus or any of those. And I think there's enough to go around. I really do. And people are always going to want to go to the movies. I really believe that. Um, I do too, but I think in terms of how much it costs to make a movie, sell a movie and put a movie in theaters and publicize it, it's not worth the money to get into theaters with the restrictions that the theaters have right now. So that's why I'm saying like, I really think it needs to be more of an event for people to go to the movies. Obviously yeah. I still want to go to the movies and stuff like that, but most of the time people don't go to the movies for the small films and most of the time the small films aren't in theaters and that's been a challenge and this is a like a leveling of the playing field a little bit um but it would be great to be able to have more q and a's you know more people going to a theater and whether it's like seeing a q and a on the screen afterwards at the theater or not but like making it something you can't get in home at your house well, thank you so much for talking to me today, Miranda. It's just so fascinating to talk to you. I could do this all day. Look, we're already going on almost a half hour. And uh, thank you for talking to me. And let's do it again soon. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too. Take care. Bye.